Yeah. 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 Or animal for <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you start off or you you want to do that introductions? Yes. Great. Okay. All right. Uh, hey, everybody. This is a Missouri chapter of RLI meeting today. We've got a pretty full agenda, so we'll kind of hop in. Welcome to everybody on Zoom as well. Hopefully, you can hear us all. The meeting is going to be recorded. We'll post it to the microsite later uh, for everybody who can join us or has conflicting meetings during this time, which is always something that occurs. Uh, so a couple things uh, off the bat, uh, sign in on the sign in sheet. We got people on Zoom. That's all good. Uh, anybody wants to join O2 leadership or NAR committees, the deadline's May 13th. Uh, and with that, we'll go to introductions. I'll let Kathy get started there. Okay. Hello, I'm Kathy Lowe. I am the Missouri chapter president for 2022. I live in northern Missouri. Um, I work for Keller, Keller Williams Spot and Partners, <coughs> and I mainly focus on recreational land and lake homes. I'm Dean Eshelman. I'm from Estes, Missouri with Three Max Best Choice and uh, focus on recreation, a little bit of timber and uh, uh, farmland. Um, it's been my company's list of properties and investments. I'm licensed in Missouri and Illinois. I do various types of transitional and development land as well as 1031 exchanges and ESG securities investments. I'm Laura simmons Markway with Remax Lake the Ozarks, Grants and Associates. Um, I'm in a pretty unique market. It's secondary uh, luxury lakefront in addition to agriculture. Dan Hartman, um, I'm the uh, treasurer of the uh, RLI chapter in Missouri, and um, I'm with Show Me Real Estate. We do a lot of uh, agriculture uh, and land development, so we take raw pieces of land and figure out the highest and best use. Austin Fee, Bank of Springfield, I'm a commercial and ag lender uh, in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, fortunate enough to be a sponsor this year. Dan brought me in, so. Uh, Mike Deering, Executive Director of the Cattlemen's Association, and very proud that I'm not in the market for land. <laughs> <laughs> so Scott Brown, I've uh, been at the University of Missouri College of Agriculture, Food, and Natural Resources, agricultural economist by training, uh, but been at MU for 30 plus years now. It's Virecki Heinz. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a fill-in. <laughs> My name is Kelly Jakovic and I'm from the St. Louis area. Um, I'm actually needing a place to sit down to prep for my next class, but I love this class. Uh, I actually was in a land uh, uh, committee in Texas when I used to work in Texas a long time ago, and I loved it. We sold a few, a few branches and things of that sort. So I, I know a little bit about it. So I hope you'll put up with me. All right, we got a few people online too. Uh, Jennifer Dance on there and uh, some other uh, attendees. Jennifer, you wanna say hello? I'm Jennifer Janet. I am in Prairieville, Missouri, which is about an hour south of St. Louis. I am the president elect and I have my accredited land consultant designation. Glad to see everybody. Sorry I wasn't there to be in person. Uh, we won't go through the purpose and mission. It's up there, but he can read it. It's been up there for a while, so we won't take time actually going through it. Uh, just a quick finance update. Uh, we're good. We'll talk about it more in executive uh, session later, but uh, we did have a, a just touch on the land one on one course that we had in Columbia, we did have to cut off registration for that because we filled it up. So that was pretty good. Um, and we'll talk about it more when we officers get together. But otherwise, it was good. So with that, we'll move on to presentations. And uh, I don't think I see this here. Really. No. Okay, so we'll just make a Springfield. Can we just sit here up there or what? However you want to do it, buddy. The camera will follow you. So. Okay. I'll just stand here then. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm in Kansas City. I work for Bank of Springfield. We're out of Illinois. I do a lot of ag and commercial lending. 
We have branches in Illinois and Missouri. Uh, most of our portfolios in those two states, including Iowa, but we do have loans across 46 states with land, commercial, and whatnot, just by virtue of following our people. So we are a SBA, FSA, USDA preferred lender, and we also work with some life insurance companies and other conduits. So I don't have much time here, but I want to be a little informative first um, before I get into those programs just lightly. But, um, you know, since stimulus and a lot of liquidity with the banks, because of that, we've seen, um, you know, more aggressive lending, riskier lending, I'd say, but not like 2008 by any means, but, um, you know, banking's competitive. It just made it that much more competitive uh, over the past year and a half, two years. So seen things like longer term fixed rates, longer term rent PAMs, rate caps, non-recourse lending, you know, higher leverage deals and whatnot. We've even seen community banks, which typically offer your, you know, three, five, seven year building structure on land, compete more with institutional lenders that offer up to 30 year fix. Not saying they all go up to 30 year fix from a community bank, but we've seen some of that, um, which has been interesting. As rates rise and liquidity dries up, we'll see less of that already right, starting to, but it's just been interesting seeing that with these low rates we've had past year. So another part of that, you know, the rates here, January until now, and my indications here are probably dated as of last week, you know, but uh, I think we're two percentage points higher on the 10-year treasury, you know, based on what life insurance companies and these, these uh, secondary markets price. So that's your home loan money, that's your secondary market commercial money. Uh, the Fed rate has only gone up 25 basis points. We're expecting another 50 here soon, but secondary market money is, uh, is pretty high. So a lot of our out-of-state uh, and in-state investors starting to cool off a little bit, uh, but farmers are still buying with high commodity prices. So Russia, Ukraine, the drought in South America, you know, their, their prices are good right now. So they're continuing to buy. Um, so I just wanted to kind of express what was in the market right now. We're seeing, it's been interesting, but um, aside from that, um, who's familiar with the Farm Service Agency, the FSA program? Yeah. So some of you who are realtors probably have lenders who um, work with the Farm Service Agency. If not, I highly recommend you, you discuss with them. It's a great program for producers, equipment, real estate, whatnot, uh, livestock. Um, there are different certifications actually for lender, which is good to inquire about as well. Um, our bank's a preferred lender. There's a few of those around the country. Um, benefit is, you know, you get experience with dealing with these FSA risks are all different, but we get your stuff in, we send it in. In 14 days, they have to give us a response. Otherwise, it's automatically approved. I know FSA offices can be, um, there's good reps, but it can also be dragged out quite a bit, which is how we used to do it. But we do so many that we got to the point where, you know, it makes sense to send it through uh, as a preferred lender. So other than that, the USDA BNI program, BNI stands for business and industry. This is more of your commercial type project in rural areas. So populations 50,000 below any projects that fit in that territory. Uh, there's really just few exceptions. Um, Gambling, golf courses, financial institutions, that's all I can really think of. Um, so you've got medical, hotel, restaurant, industrial, warehouse, manufacturing, all kinds of stuff, even outfitting businesses um, in those areas. And it can't be a refinance per se, but more like a, a build out or a new project or an acquisition. That's your secondary market opportunity with your uh, community banks if they do offer that program. Um, you have to a 30-year fix on real estate, 15 on equipment, anything in between. So aside from blue financing, that's an option. And I would say the 50,000 population, if it does run <coughs> contiguous, like I'm from Liberty, 37,000 population, it sits, it sits right next to Kansas City. So it doesn't qualify. Excelsior Springs and Carney do. So that 50,000 isn't a firm 50, but you know if it runs right along St. Louis, for example, it probably doesn't qualify. There is a map. So... I can send it to you all afterwards if you're interested. Uh, it does outline in detail those, those boundaries. Um, a pretty new program that came out two or three months ago, the Food Supply Chain Program for USDA, is, uh, is, uh, it's, it's a good program. Uh, it's basically the BNI program for fine. Um, there's no USDA guarantee fee. There's no spread in the interest rate for them. So basically, banks can get the guarantee, and we do this for USDA or FSA. We get the guarantee and we sell it in the secondary market 
for a long term fix, you know, up to 30 years, whatever, 15 year reset, 30 year, whatever it is. Um, you know, not a lot of banks sell it. When they do, they'll put their point, two point spread on it. We're known to take 25 to 50 basis points. So, any new projects pertaining to food supply chain, you know, food storage, distribution, processing, there's no, there's no population requirement on that. It could be in Manhattan, New York. You know, I mean, there's other problems there with that, but uh, from a population standpoint, that it's out the window. So, um, they're really wanting to get these, these slaughter plants, processing facilities up. You know, there's basically the big four and whatnot, but um, they're trying to try to get that going for small and mid-sized producers. So they're putting this program out there. It's very friendly for borrowers wanting to start those projects. So um, I touched on all this very, very lightly. If anyone is interested in details, I can talk further afterwards, get my contact information. Um, again, Austin makes Springfield. So Thank you, Austin. I, I just I was introduced to Austin about a year ago through fellow contacting and to get to know him. And uh, just recently uh, did, a, did a transaction with a Baylor. So I was going to say it's absolutely wonderful. Uh, we're just a small producer, hay and cattle in uh, north, uh, just in Smithfield, just north of Kansas City. And uh, it was a wonderful experience dealing with you. So I'd encourage you to uh, reach out to him and, and uh, give him an opportunity. Any questions, I, I guess, from our uh, online or across? Thank you, Austin. He's got some goodies too in the end here. So, thank you, Rob. We want to introduce our speakers. There's room. Do you want to introduce our speakers? Yeah, I'd be glad to. So, um, we're really excited to have uh, Mike Deering, Executive Director of Missouri Cattlemen Association, and Dr. Scott Brown. They're going to give us an update today, kind of just on, I guess, the state of cattle industry, agriculture. There's a lot of things going on in, in agriculture, and uh, so we're excited to have you guys. So please, uh, the floor is yours. Well, this should be fun, right, Scott? All right. Yeah. No pressure. <laughs> Every other slide, we're just going to go back and forth. No, so Dan called a while back and asked if I could do this and said, you want to talk about the state of the industry? And I said, well, I'm not really the best guy. Your best guy is Dr. Scott Brown. And so I gave him Scott's cell phone number. He called Scott. Scott made up this thing that he was in D.C. <laughs> so I, I called Scott last night and I say, hey, I need some slides. I need to review some of your stuff since you're going to be in D.C. And he said, what are you talking about? I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> so anyway, that trip got canceled. And I said, you're hopping in the vehicle and we're going to Jeff City to help me out here. So um, hopefully most of you are familiar with the Missouri Cattlemen's Association. This guy taking pictures. His dad is a past president of our association. So good to see you. Thank you for outing me. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure we're all out in the open. <laughs> But no, our association is about 5,000 people. We're primarily, we have youth programs, we have a foundation, we have a lot of different things going on, educational activities and opportunities, but really we're policy focused. We're here a lot in Jefferson City and Washington, D.C., trying to push meaningful legislation forward, stop bad legislation, push meaningful regulations forward and stop the bad ones and those kind of things. So our association, um, uh, not to brag, but we're a powerhouse in this town. We're very successful on the policy side. We often work hand in hand with the Realtors Association, Bankers Association, and others. Um, we're the only association in this town that has their members at the Capitol every single Wednesday of legislative session. We don't do this once a year, we do it every single week. We have anywhere from five to 20 um, Cowboys at the Capitol every single Wednesday talking face to face with legislators. And that's really the secret of our success and why we have been so successful. Um, we're the only association that's led six ever veto overrides. Um, and so, and led the first ever veto override in Missouri's history on ag legislation. It's all because of that grassroots involvement. So, your presence here at the Capitol, uh, making your cause known, is extremely important. It works. Lot, you have a great lobbyist, Sam's great, but it takes you um, coming to the Capitol to talk to legislators to really get things done and to move the needle forward. Um, as you know, with our association, you know, we're grassroots. Our policy comes from the bottom up, but we work for probably, if you, would, if you do work with cattle farmers, you believe me when I say we work with the most independent minded people on the planet. <laughs> so whenever we push for something, we're collective in that, 
That's a big deal uh, because getting you, – you put 12 cattle producers in a room, you come out with a solution, you, you've got something. Um, so that's kind of and, – and we need more of those. So we've got about 5,000 members, but we need more members to be able to do that. Um, it, it, uh, I haven't caught up with Scott for a while, but I was sitting here talking to him and he was asking about my kids and wife and all this stuff. And, and he, uh, I said, you know, they're doing good. And he said, well, let me tell you what happened to me the other day. And he said he was over at the Thompson Greenlee Research Center looking at cows, kind of enjoying life out of the office. And he hears this voice, a real sexy voice. And it says, kiss me on the lips. I'll turn in the most beautiful woman you've ever seen. He keeps walking and it says it again. And he looks down, it's a frog. And it says, kiss me on the lips, I'll turn into the most beautiful woman you've ever seen. So Scott leaned down, started to put the frog in his pocket. And the frog said, you fool, did you hear me? Kiss me on the lips, I'll turn into the most beautiful woman you've ever seen. I said, okay, Scott, so what'd you do? He said, I put the frog in my pocket. I said, why wouldn't you have kissed the frog? He said, you know what, Darren, at my age, I'd rather have a talking frog. <laughs> and, uh, and that's kind of, and the point of that is with our association with your association not all members are going to agree but when you work together and you and same with mary same with anything but when you work together and you join together and you go to this capital you go to washington dc and you stand collectively for a cause then you really see action happen and so i'm glad to be a part uh, of this conference and glad that you invited us but really, you need to hear what Scott Brown has to say. He's going to go through. He's got a lot of slides, but he's going to run through them, kind of go over the overall state, not only of the cattle industry, but other commodities that you may work in as well. He's the best in the state, if not best in the nation. Our association works with him very closely and think, uh, think a lot of him. So, Scott, I'll let you <coughs> do your thing. Thanks, Mike. I wasn't sure where that story was headed. But, uh, I knew I was in trouble with it when you started down the road. So it's, it's good to visit with you all for a few minutes. Uh, I've got uh, 65 slides. We'll try to get through them in 10 minutes. I'm just kidding. I have a few slides, all right? I, I promise not to run too too long. Before I start there, all right, so I've been at the University of Missouri for uh, a, a, over three decades. I grew up in the very northwest corner of Missouri on a uh, diversified operation um, and decided to go get my master's degree at University of Missouri and I just never left after that so Columbia has been home for a long time um, but one of the jobs one of the hats I wear that might be of interest to you all so every two years every other year I should say the state tax commission sets ag productivity values so it's it's how we tax ag land uh, the University of Missouri is responsible for providing input into that process. It's, a, it's another time where Mike and I get the chance to interact. He may not always agree with what we might say is in terms of what ag productivity value should do uh, in, in the state. But uh, if, if you're worried about how our property taxes on ag land calculated, every other year I get myself for some reason involved in trying to help the state tax commission with that. So good. Go to the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> no, I, I, so a couple of things I, I want to do is just kind of take the big picture view here for a minute. If you look at farm income in the country uh, for 2021, uh, gold line there, a little more than $110 billion. You know, you, you look at face value and it's been good, right? You see the, all right, so everybody's really quiet today. The good, good demand for ag land, right? And, and there are plenty of buyers, maybe not as many sellers as you might want right now. Is that true? Yeah. All right, so, so I go, you just look at what's happened. Now I'll say, you know, don't forget, this got to be a little tough right through here. We were kind of coming through a period of a, a lot of concern about economic viability and you would have thought COVID-19 would have just accelerated that, but in fact, the opposite seems to have occurred. It's been a really good time. Now I will say the problem here is volatility, all right? I'm, I'm, so I'm not suggesting this is all rosy, but when you look at just the absolute level of farm income, it's some of the highest, you know, we, we always talk about 2014. I, I used to say the second golden age of agriculture just the level of farm income that we saw in that year, even cattle, even our Missouri cattle producers. I, I, I said, even Scott Brown could have raised cattle in 2014 and made money. Uh, it, it was so good from a price perspective. Now, 2022, USDA is still saying 
It's, it's a fairly good outlook for farm income uh, in, in the country for 2022, but we have a few things that we can certainly talk about that raises some concern for us. I, I will say for me, I look at this kind of big picture and, and I go, it looks like land values don't soften very much in the near term. We pumped a lot of money into agriculture. It's a, it's a very different place in terms of how much money is available to put into these land purchases that maybe in the past we didn't have. And, and I think we don't wanna forget that we're in a much better position than we've been for a while. Next slide. Now, I, I will say more receipts, all right? So demand has been good for our ag commodities. If you look uh, over the period, all right? So the red bar is 2020, the, the green bar is uh, 2022 projections from USDA, more farm receipts, higher crop prices, all right? So you have Ukraine, Russia situation going on. It's done nothing but tighten up a lot of our grain markets that have moved those prices higher. South America crop, not as big maybe as we would have thought a little bit earlier. So we're getting more receipts going in, higher cattle prices. Um, so, so everything on the receipt side has been fairly good. The problem is expenses, all right? So what's a 20 uh, billion increase over the 21 to 22 projection, <clears throat> higher fertilizer prices, all right? You can't go very far without folks talking about What's the current anhydrous ammonia price? Now I'll say to cattlemen in particular, I worry about what we're gonna do in fertilizer application this year. because so I think some of them are gonna decide it's time to pass. And, and I'm not sure that's the right strategy for our cattle producers, but it's so expensive, it's hard to, to probably justify economically applying at rates we might have in the past. So those expenses are higher. I go COVID-19 has driven every expense higher, period. There is not one that's lower. So I don't care what we look at, it's, it, it's all higher. Government payments, all right, so I remind us in COVID-19, all right, so in the worst of COVID-19, we rolled $46 billion out the door, which is very atypical. I think that has helped land values today because if you're a producer and you get payments, those payments, you'd like to go plow them in somewhere, right? Otherwise, I might have to pay taxes on them. So how do I help myself? I might want to invest in land. We've gone from 46 billion to projections of less than 12 billion. So back to more traditional kinds of levels of payments I'm going out as, as we look ahead. And again, farm income. So down in 2022 relative to uh, 2021, but still fairly high levels. Next slide. So we've got a lot of debate about how much corn and soybeans are planted in this country this year. Uh, USDA gave us perspective plantings back at the end of March, a little less than 90 million acres of, of uh, corn, a little more than 90 million acres of soybeans. When you look at those two lines by themselves, we'll skip wheat here for a second, planting about 180 million acres of those two commodities. So there's a lot of fight about how much corn and how much soybeans we plant, but there's less fight about how much in total of those two commodities we plant. So where corn prices have gone of late, uh, might pull some more corn acres in by the time we get to a June acreage report from USDA. So, so we'll wait and see, but we're not adding a lot of land to corn and soybean production. So we, we aren't seeing maybe as much supply response as we would have seen historically. We have been taking away from wheat, but when you look at wheat prices today, uh, Ukraine was very important in, in global wheat production. We're not sure what kind of crop they're gonna get in the ground and get out this year. So I, I think there's some issues about uh, wheat enough to keep wheat prices high as well. And we may see a lot more wheat acres in this state than we've seen for a while as well. Next slide. So a lot of demand pull, all right? So we talk a lot about renewable diesel today. Uh, you, you might've heard us talk about biodiesel in the past, but renewable diesel, uh, you see the expansion 
I sometimes go, this looks an awful lot like ethanol in 2008, 2009, right? Now, currently under construction setting here, proposed or announced, I go at the end of the day, I'm gonna be a little surprised for us to get all that to come on board, but we might. And if we do, we just have pretty strong demand pull. And I pick soybeans, but I could pick corn and talk about what might be stronger ethanol use. We can look at this year with the president announcing E15 in the summer. All else equal, I think we grind a little more corn. It might make it a little tougher on the cattle industry, for example, because all else equal, we get a little higher corn prices. But there's demand pull. It's not just all supply side. I often tell my students, the other piece of this is global. All right, so we've already talked about Ukraine, but I'll say, I tell them all the time, some old faculty member up here lecturing to you and they ask you about you know, what's important from a trade perspective, you'll be right 70% of the time if you answer China. All right, so Ch China matters in all of these commodities. Next slide. All right, so I wanna just point out for a minute, so blue line's just market receipts for corn in this case. The stack of the bar are overhead and variable expenses. We often think about this period. So this was kind of the ethanol boom period, if you will, for corn. So the difference between the stack of the bar and the line is what's kind of market returns, if you will, that include government payments. So this fairly wide during that period of time. Now look at 2020 and 2021. It's been fairly good. That doesn't include the fact we got CARES Act payments, et cetera, on top of that. So it, it has been fairly good. And I could put other commodities besides corn up there and, and they would look similar. All right, next slide. So as Mike alluded to, I can get, I can get bullish cattle. Now we've gotten sometimes I think bullish too quickly cattle. because so we still have a lot of cattle in the feed yard today. We won't have a lot of cattle in the feed yard as we get later in the 2022. So we're gonna have fewer cattle supplies less beef cows. So we peaked in 2019, we've been going down. I say, we're gonna keep going down for the next couple of years. Why? Yeah, so, so drought is one of the issues. So not so much from Missouri, so US cow numbers. You take, uh, no, go one more slide. All right, so this is hay stocks for you. Um, and uh, un, the, the numbers that aren't underlined is the change in hay stocks December of 2021 relative to December of 2020. All right, so the reds, so I'll take the Dakotas here, down more than 40% in hay stocks. Wow. It's dry, right? It's dry. Mike can talk to his cattle compatriots, compatriots in the other states. They're going to tell him it's a mess. Now, you see here's from really the 2021 weather. You look at 2022 weather, and all of a sudden you can add right in here, Texas has been starting really dry as well. So drought has been a big piece of that puzzle. Now I will say economics have not been all that great for cow-calf producers in this state. Well, they have it. So if this is going on, it could be really good for us, right? Good. Longer term. Two or three years down the road, we could have very high cattle prices. We'll have to wait and see. Go ahead. Country you of origin labeling. <coughs> I met you in Miller County with uh, Willard Kaley. <laughs> and I, I told you that I wanted that then. So, all right, country, all right, so country of origin labeling. Um, so certainly political, number one, I'll say, right? There are people who, who love country of origin. So I'll ask this question. How many of you are willing to pay more for beef that says made in the USA? I, sure. Yeah. All right. So then I sometimes respond by, we're not typical here in, in this part of the, of the country. Why do I say that? We're still fairly close to rural areas of this state. If I live on the coast, what am I willing to pay for country of origin labor? So I leave that question. It's not, I can't answer it, but I, I sometimes worry for them it's price driven. <coughs> now, when we do country of origin labeling, where's that label show up? It shows up when you go to the grocery store to buy beef, right? 
What happens when you go to the restaurant to eat beef? No label. How much of our beef is consumed at restaurants? So, so a lot. All right. So I go with, this is not an easy question. Mike, you can jump in and, and, and argue with against me, right? Because there's some folks who firmly so when believe- the Obama administration put cool, mandatory cool in place, we had cool in place, and then Congress uh, mandated that an economic analysis be done. Kansas State and the University of Missouri did that economic analysis. Could you maybe share what that economic analysis said? Yes. Yeah, so it, it basically came back to say you did not shift demand enough, right? So the idea of you label in, in the USA, how much do you shift demand for that product? That analysis did not suggest we get a big outward shift in consumer demand. So th that it, it would suggest there isn't a lot of consumer preference for that made in the USA label. Would that change now with everything that's going on in the world? So, so perhaps it would. Um, I'll often say for me now, I see the local angle more important than the USA label. Correct. And there's an opportunity for our producers in this state to market more directly to consumers that I think has some big value. Now, to process those cattle, it's going to cost more because we do it in smaller facilities that are more costly. The USDA, though, from what I understand, and you probably know more about this, they're starting to lift some of those restrictions, right, for the cattle producers? Oh, what kind of restrictions? The processing restrictions. No. Um, so at the state level, we are one of seven states that you could, you could sell, you know, certain plants can sell um, out, not just in Missouri, a state inspected beef can be sold in uh, interstate, out of state, um, but we're only one of seven states, but there's been no restriction lifted at the federal level that I'm aware of. So correct, right? But I'll come back to the point made earlier about there's, there's Biden the money available for investment in smaller processing. processing. And that plants. money is, yeah, you're right there. And, um, and so I, I, I don't know as much about that program as maybe I should, but, um, that there is money for that kind of expansion. I, I just say, if consumers want local beef, we should provide them local beef. If they're willing to pay more for it, we should we should provide it to them. Um, that 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 to me is growing overall beef demand, and it's nothing but a win at the end of the day. To, so the last thing I'll say about country of origin labeling. So the WTO World Trade Organization actually ruled against us on country of origin labeling, and if we want to go ahead and label. I think it's a couple of billion dollars a year in uh, tariffs that Mexico and Canada could put on our products. That they were. did. They could, right? And it wouldn't have to be against beef. It could be against anything else, frankly. They just get so much, right? So I didn't say all that to say I'm opposed or I'm for country of origin labeling because it's a politically hot potato, but it, it, it's, it's an issue worth uh, discussing. Next slide. Sorry, I didn't mean to derail you there. No, no, it's 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 okay. I'd much rather answer the questions that you all have than uh, just thrown on. All right. So, do I think cattle prices can go higher? Yes. Now, what do I know about 2023 and that my forecast for 2023? What do I know about it? It'll be wrong. All right. If I was really good at this. Mike Deering would not have convinced me to come down here to the Capitol Plaza Hotel today, right? I don't know where I would have been at, but the direction that we're headed, that's what I can get more excited about. And I will say, having drought in other parts of the country and not here is a benefit to us. However, when you look at cow numbers, Mike and I were having this conversation yesterday, Missouri beef cow inventory fell 95,000 head last year second largest decline to North Dakota. I'm not sure why that happened because we were not dry here. It declined how much? 90, 94,000 head. Now, I think we lost a lot of small, smaller operations. I see my windshield as I travel the state, I see more bigger operations coming, cow-calf operations okay. coming. Um, could we have lost some pasture land to soybeans when I can get 16 or $17 a bushel for those soybeans? 
Yeah, I think we did around the edges. Um, I think profitability was tough enough that some folks said I could do something else. So I, I think all those things are at play, but we've kind of been bucking the trend of a few other states who actually have shown increases. You've got a farm that used to cost two to 5,000 an acre and you can get 10 to 15 an acre now. Why? I push yourself through it. And, and I think when you look at some of the land that we typically would have run cattle on, there's a lot of other pressure for that land to either hunt on or other recreation on that continues to kind of eat away. Now we have plenty of pasture land. We have plenty of pasture land in the state to handle the cow numbers that we have. We're not very efficient at times with that land. All right, let's slide. All right, so you're gonna hear this all the time, right? So volatility and cost. So here's fertilizer that has roughly doubled. So our crop producers are, are certainly paying a lot more to get corn, especially uh, in the ground this spring. Fuel prices have gone up, labor, all right? Everywhere we go, right? We talk about not having enough labor. Um, you look at the labor cost and, and I go, it's gonna do nothing but keep going up in my book. Uh, we just don't have enough labor out there. Um, when you look at all production items, so this is the issue. We've got very high output prices. We've got costs going up at the same time. Some people will say eventually those output prices will turn lower, but we don't think those input costs probably move down as quickly as we would see the prices for commodities. Next slide, and I'll, I'll be done here soon. So general economic story here for a minute. All right, so I got disposable income on, on here in the green line, so think about what's in your pocket. I've got consumption expenditures, so what are you spending? All right, so I just for a minute say prior to COVID, those two lines ran on top of each other. All right, so when you think about COVID, so disposable income went up to uh, almost an 8% growth in 2020. Why? Stimulus, right? And why did the personal uh, consumption expenditures go down by 3%? We all stayed home. And then I could only stay with Mike Deering for so long and then I needed to get out and spend in 2021, right? <laughs> so we all spent a lot. This, this dot right here, right? So 2022, zero. Do y'all remember the Great Recession of 08 and 09? All right, so I don't know what to think about the general economy. I sometimes worry we put stimulus out there that just delayed what we eventually are gonna have happen. So if we have a recession, it's probably not good for us in agriculture. And that could be coming. Next slide. <clears throat> And then, so what's, we, we've had all this discussion about very high CPI, right? Record inflation, blah, 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 blah. All right, most folks will say that's gonna come back down to 2%. We'll see. I think we're in for inflation for a period of time and, and that has impacts as well. So I'm gonna quit. I think there might be a slide or two left, but yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, questions for me, cause I know we're, so, um, yeah, Dr. Brown, thank you for the, the in-depth presentation. I, I'm interested to hear, Mike, an update on the average herd size um, in the state of Missouri, uh, where we rank, where we rank nationally. I mean, you always have had these, these yeah. numbers. So, <laughs> um, right now, I mean, this could have changed, but 36 head is the state average. What? 36 head. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's a, what it has been for the last several years. I don't think that has changed as it's done. No, not really. So, Where are we ranking as far as cow cat? I know we've got some So we always bounce from second to third to second to third on, uh, on cow calf. Right now we're third, um, third largest cow calf state in the country. We're second behind Texas on the number of cattle farms. Where's the first? Texas. Texas, Oklahoma. Oh, Okay, I you said Missouri. This. Yeah, Texas, Oklahoma, Missouri would be on the cow calf side on the number of farms. It's Texas and then a big, huge okay. gap and then Missouri. I was thinking, how many operations are there? There's 30 average head size, head herd size is 36. Uh, 52,000. Is that about right? Uh, are, I don't, still are we still there? So, so 1.8 million head divided by 36. Six. 
Sorry, I don't. We were we were right around 50, 58,000. I think that's gone down though. Um, so could it have something to do with the average age of the farmer? I know around our area we've lost a lot of hay farmers because they've either retired or passed away. Um, their their so spouses 50, or yeah. significant others or family doesn't want to raise cattle, so they sell the cattle. Have you seen any of that increase recently? Well, I think that I don't think that's just um, cattle. So agriculture in general, the average age of a farmer in Missouri is 56. Nationally, it's 58. Less than 5% are under 35 years old. So that's a, a trend that um, agriculture organizations are very concerned about. When I'm asked about the biggest threat in agriculture, I don't mention some of these policy things. I mention the age of the farmer. Um, if we do not repopulate the land with the next generation, then all these other things become a meat point pretty quickly. So I do think we're seeing some retirement that when it occurs, that land probably doesn't stay in its 36 head operation, right? Somebody's gonna either purchase it or lease it or rent it and probably replace it with a larger operation. The data doesn't really suggest we've seen that much of that happening yet. But, but I take my dairy uh, work to say, I see a lot of dairy states who when that 50 cow dairy operation goes away, the kids don't want to do it, no. right? They're, they're gonna go do something else. You can't support their family. At, and, and they are frankly don't wanna work the 24 seven 365 that it takes right. on a dairy farm. I, I think that's where it's a little different for us in the beef cattle side. You still have a lot of retirees who can run 35 head and it it's less labor intensive than a lot of other things we could be doing in agriculture so with the rising um uh cost of fertilization and things of that nature uh jeremiah markway my ex-husband big advocate for sustainable farming and mixing in the sheep with the cattle uh and doing that rotational grazing are you seeing more farmers move towards that We're on rotational grazing, absolutely. Um, more producers are adapting to that. And what Scott said earlier, we're not very good managers with our grass. He's right. Uh, we're leaving a lot of grass on the table, so to speak. Um, if we did more rotational grazing, if we practiced more warm season rotation, cool season grasses, and did some of these things, I think we could definitely pack more cows onto the acres that we have. Um, the university, not in Scott's world, but um, Jordan Thomas and some of those folks are really focused on, on that aspect. As far as um, sheep and goats, more and more producers are doing that. I mean, if you look at the sheep market, uh, 40 pound lamb, $4 a pound. So the margin's more, better. Yeah, <laughs> but undoubtedly. Um, and so, and I am one of those. Uh, we, we now have 150 head of hair sheep behind that we rotate behind our cattle. So the trend is more toward the larger corporate farms? I don't believe that is true in the cattle industry in the state, do you? So <coughs> do, do I think we're headed to larger farms? Yes. I wouldn't say corporate farms. And, and maybe that's just a play on words. To me, it's larger family operations that are trying to, to really be what we end up with. Um, and, and that's, all right, so I see it more and more of mom and dad are saying, I want my kids to come back to the rural part of Missouri. All right, so why did Scott Brown leave Northwest Missouri 30 some odd years ago? Because I thought I had better opportunities than staying on the farm at the time, which was the 1980s, by the way. So it was tough right through there. So, so you need scaling in order to make it work. So, and I will say this is, so you, you pressed my economist button. There are economies of scale and everything we do in agriculture yep. today. And the bigger you get, you get to take advantage of those economies of scale. If you don't do anything, all else equal, we tend to get bigger. It's why we have four big beef packers today. It's, it's why we see folks running 11,000 acres of land, somebody. Uh, yeah. Right? That, I, so it's those economies of scale. And it's, it's not only then what my costs are, it's then I can purchase enough volume to get a discount on those inputs as well. And, and, and yeah, so it's, it is risk management st strategy. So at the end of the day, you just let economics play. 
And whoever's the most efficient are the ones that are going to be left at the end of the day. Being big doesn't guarantee you efficiency because I've seen big producers who are terrible managers. But if you're big and efficient, you likely are better off than smaller operations because you just have scale economies they don't have. How many corporate farmers do we have in Missouri? Capital. I don't know of any. Corporate. I was going to say. I don't know of any either. I didn't know if maybe there was one like flying under the radar. No, no, I don't think so. Not that I'm aware of. And then the big Packers, they can't, I mean, they cannot play in the, in the cow-calf game. So. And if you, all right, so if you look at what's coming for us in Missouri, so American Foods Group appears to be ready to break ground on a new cattle processing plant, 2,400 head a day over near uh, St. Louis. 50% cows, 50% fat. And that's St. Cows 50 what? Cap? 50% fat. Oh. Fat cattle. Fed cattle, fed yeah. cattle on 50%. Primarily, they're probably going to go after dairy cows. But they'll take cows. Yeah. Um, you can drop them off at their but, doors. But when you say corporate farmers, I uh, think you need to differentiate between management of farm and land ownership. Yeah. But aren't a lot of the lands owned by the, the large corporation and sort of a lease back or lease through to the family farmer? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, we're really not, we don't see that. Yeah. There's, there's very little corporate ownership of land in this state. Um, I can't remember. There's some, there's some numbers out there, but it's a, even nationwide. It's yeah, pretty like 3% maybe maximum is, yeah, is. Yeah. Iowa, that's right. <clears throat> so what else does Missouri have from it? Yeah. Well, they have the American Foods Group. So with that, with American Foods Group, I mean, we're getting the cart before the horse a little bit. We're not feeding any cattle in the state. I think that's the opportunity for the next generation. I think that's the opportunity for people to go to the University of Missouri or some other institution, come back, put that degree to work, just to be able to feed cattle um, in Missouri. Um, traditionally, we have not done that, partly because of the mud, but new technology allow for monoslopes, for hoop buildings and others, and producers are proving that it can be profitable. And I think there's opportunity there. Um, and then politically, we worked really hard to pass Senate Bill 391. And the realtors actually supported that, um, that would stop county governments from being able to pass uh, restrictive ordinances that, um, that are more stringent than state law. So there were many emotional ordinances being passed that would put farmers and ranchers out of business um, if that wasn't stopped. And so we made sure there were no longer a patchwork of regulations and that nothing could be more stringent than what's scientifically founded and passed at the state level. I, I, I agree with you, Mike. I think that we've really worked on, we have a small operation, we're, we're growing um, slowly, but we're really focusing on some of those high protein feeds. Or we've, we've, of course, done the silage and alfalfa. We're looking at uh, forage beans. We're looking at ways to really not just feed hay to maintain the cattle through the winter months. So we want to start seeing some weight gain. And, and so it, have, you, have you heard of other producers in the state really focusing on that or kind of going towards that? So I think with $8 corn, the idea of putting weight on cattle without feeding them corn uh, give, gives us a, a good opportunity to take advantage of the forage base we have here. Probably haven't seen that very much so far, but these feed costs are getting serious. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think we can get cattle instead mm -hmm. of putting them in the feed yard at five or 600 pounds, we're putting them in the yard at seven or 800 pounds. Mm -hmm. That may make economic sense. So for those investing right now in some of those forage opportunities, they may pay dividends if we keep corn prices at 750 or wherever we're, at, we're setting at today. Uh, I sometimes worry about saying that too loudly because we put a good crop in the bin this fall. And for some reason, we get over this Ukraine-Russia conflict. What happens to prices? China's been a big buyer of corn the last few weeks. Uh, do they continue to be a big buyer of corn? I think they're doing a lot of risk management themselves right now by buying both old crop and new crop from us. And uh, so I'm always careful about selling too hard, putting weight on cattle via forage is the way to go. But where price is set today, it certainly is for corn. 
All right, we're at 30 minutes. We're 10 minutes over, Scott. So uh -oh. We're good. Anybody else have any Thank questions? You. No. You're welcome. That's the ration. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. With that, we're going to wrap up, everybody. Uh, this uh, the recording will be online too on the schedule conference page, so everybody can watch. Uh, and we'll see you later. We got a meeting in here afterwards, so that's why I'm rushing off. <laughs> All right, uh, Austin's got some stuff for those who participate.